Just to give you a little bit of background before I turn it over to Mr. Patel, he has a uh, bachelor's in economics and psychology, um, a master's in social work, and a uh, master's in education. He has 29 years of experience um, with child welfare services, as well as 26 years um, in a supervisory or managerial position. So um, with that in mind, I will turn it over to Mr. Patel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Much better. Much better. Thank you. So what can I tell about myself? As Laura pointed out, five months ago, I started my 30th year in the child welfare services. 30 years ago, I started my career with uh, San Diego Child Protective Services. In those days, we did not have any training unit. I was welcomed by my supervisor and says, here is your desk, and you have 14 cases, and you have 16 days to prepare your first court report. Those of us who've been around. Well, before I started my career in child welfare services, I also used to organize management training programs for middle and top executives. So I have both formal <coughs> education in social work as well as in management. As a result of that, I think my supervisors, my peers, quickly picked up and branded me as a cleanup man with a high degree of can-do attitude. I was recruited to take over a very difficult assignments. Uh, sections, they were marred by low productivity, complaints, late court reports, court elevations, all those things that we had, right? Working with my staff, supervisors, and my superiors, I had developed a formula a long time ago. Clear expectations plus coaching plus monitoring equals quality performance. And as a reason, my section, my units were able to demonstrate, we were able to create a corporate culture of a learning organization. And when I talk about being a learning organization, it means three important things. Staff with well-developed core competencies. A culture that promotes ongoing quality improvement and an ability to fundamentally renew and revitalize. Those are essential qualities. Now, that's what I was able to do in my jobs in San Diego and currently in San Mateo County. What does that have to do with my job that I'm about to take over here in this county? It's the same thing. You look at the Ohio manual and the expectation talks about the same thing. You've got to have people who should be competent. They should have well mastered core competencies, right? So that we can provide quality services. We've got to have a continuous improvement. We are in the business of change. Even though some of us behave change, right? That's what we expect our clients to do, right? Change. Give up their some abusive behaviors and take on some increased protect, protective capacity and positive parenting. Give up their substance abuse issues, anger management issues, and be a fully productive contributing members of the society. The world is changing. If I go right now, if I buy an iPad, in less than 30 seconds, somebody halfway around the world in China is going to know one iPad got sold. As a result, we have to keep up and create a culture that promotes that we survive, we thrive. Chaos is the name of the game, but we also have to make sure that we are prepared to deal with that kind of eventualities. And I know long time ago when I used to do management training programs, I used to teach the middle and top executives. 
people get up. People get ready. Some may take half an hour. Someone like me take an hour, hour and a half maybe sometimes. We get in the car, we drive, we come to work. We come to do a quality work. Nobody says, oh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to office and I'm going to do a lousy job, right? <laughs> we don't do that. As a manager, as an administrator, that's what I realized a long time ago. I have to create an environment wherein I can strike a balance. I want to support, I want to motivate, I want to instill, I want to unleash the energy, <coughs> the creativity that people bring to work. Give them a meaningful work, create an environment that supports them. How many of you know that the job that we do in the child welfare services is the second most stressful job in the United States, according to a federal study. <laughs> you, you need, you need somebody with a sound emotional intelligence. Somebody who is not on this extreme or on this extreme. Somebody who empathizes. In my 30 years, as I said, there is not a single aspect of the child welfare services work that I have not directly worked in it, supervised it, or managed it. Been that, done that, right from the receiving home outline all the way to uh, adoption, permanency, whatever you call it. Been that, done that. I have acquired so much knowledge. And to be honest with you, San Mateo County is the second richest county in the state of California. If I tell you how much our social worker top out, you will all go, wow. But wait, wait, don't do that yet. $92,000 per year. Don't say that. In order for you to get a one bedroom apartment, it will cost you $2,700. So that goes the wow. It, <laughs> it, 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 creates, it creates a special challenges for uh, the San Mateo County in my county. When the economy goes up, is doing well, we see a spike in the child welfare services. When the economy goes down, we see the downward trend. It's an inverted relationship. As the economy is getting better, people are getting jobs. And the median income for San Mateo County resident is $92,000 per year. You know and I know, not everybody is going to make $92,000. But they are making enough that disqualifies them from the safety net services. So therefore, we see a spike in the child welfare services. San Mateo County is the 14th largest county, but we have the fourth lowest case load. <clears throat> Again, thanks to San Mateo County's leadership at the county level, we are an overmatch county. And I'm assuming you all know what an overmatch county is, right? We get our, our funding from the federal and state government. In order to get $60 from the federal government, we have to come up with $40. That's the levy that my priority, with your help, with the community's help, with everybody's help, is to make sure we get that passed. I want to tell the community, by not passing, you are losing money. Imagine, close your eyes. This whole conference room is filled with dollar bills. <coughs> they are just sitting there. It's called Title for e money. It's uncapped money. In order for us to get, get that money, we got to just come up with the matching fund. If it's a training, if it's an enhanced training, I just need $25 to get $75. That's what the community needs to hear from us. That will be my priority to make sure that that community understands clearly. That's how we maximize. If I bring $75 in this community, it creates a multiplier effect. A social worker who's going to get paid, a foster mom who's going to get 
some money. <coughs> An attorney, the judges, uh, the clinicians, they spend money. It creates economic growth. It's an economic incentive for this county, and people need to understand that. If necessary, I'm willing to go to door to door, knock on each and every door, and explain to them why they should pass that. It's not only about our job, but it's in the society's best interest. It's a win-win-win situation, as I say. <coughs> About the child welfare services, as I said, uh, you can ask me any question. Uh, why, do, why do I want to leave California and why do I want to come here? You're thirsty. You're thirsty. I know, I know some of you, I know some of you uh, are thinking, well, why this guy wants to leave San Mateo County, the rich county, and wants to come here? Well, I realize if you have spent 30 years, you have acquired so much knowledge. And unlike you, San Mateo was behind in getting accredited. My agency became the first public service agency back in 2008 to get accredited, the entire human services agency. While Lucas County got accredited back in 2005. So I became a peer reviewer for the Council on Accreditation. I have been to eight different encounters. I have done county governments, state-run systems. I have done uh, non-profit organizations. Just last week I was in Chicago. Uh, doing a, another uh, reaccreditation. And then I realized, if I know so much, if I still have so much to offer, I still have eight more years to go before I can think about my retirement, why not share that knowledge? I have ethical responsibility to my profession. About eight months ago, I was in Ohio uh, doing the same thing, uh, evaluating an agency for their accreditation. After my assignment, I took a couple of days off. I was driving around, visiting my friends. What I saw, I really liked it. Those of you who have been to California, you know what I mean. You hardly see so much open space. I mean, this morning, just from Detroit to my hotel, it was so wonderful. I have never seen such a gorgeous morning. Uh, the sun came up, my flight landed at 6 a.m. And, and, and it's, entirely, it's entirely different lifestyle over here. I, and it's good, and it's good. And, and, and I realized, I said, look, I like cold weather. If I ever have to leave California, uh, I wouldn't mind uh, coming over to Ohio, and here I am, talking to you all wonderful people, trying to make my case why <laughs> I should be hired, why I should be here. So that's why I want to come here, and again, uh, uh, I like to share. Over the years, I've been told that I should have been a professor. I should have been a teacher. That's the comment I have gotten from a lot of people. I like to teach. Uh, I have two masters, one in social work, uh, one in uh, instructional technology, that's education. Uh, and over the years, I have completed executive uh, program uh, under Berkeley. Uh, in the Bay Area, all the counties have decided that any time somebody wants to become a manager or a director should complete the executive development program. I have also completed the public sector academy uh, certificate program since 2008. A lot has happened at the local level, at the city level, at the county level. 
And that's where it's really uh, interesting. I hope there are some opportunities here. I would encourage you all to sign up. In my 30 years, I have been to zillion hours of trainings, you name it, uh, concurrent planning, emergency response, motivational interviewing, uh, the safety organized practice, trauma-informed intervention assessment. I also like to read up on management. Uh, so I like to strike the balance between social work as well as in management. Now that I'm in management, uh, when I was in uh, San Diego as a regional senior manager, my region alone used to have 1,350 children at any given point. That's entire population that Lucas County serves. San Diego, just to give you a context, was and is the second largest county uh, in the state of California. We used to have, at any given point, 6,600 children. There were 16 courtrooms, full-time, Monday to Friday. And in my 30 years, I have had the pleasure of working with at least 13 to 14 presiding judges in San Diego as well as in San Mateo County. Uh, if you stay in this business for a long time, like myself, majority of my supervisors have retired on, moved on, the baby, baby boomers, right? But I'm fortunate if Laura were to call me and say, Praveen, can you give me your references? I have four references, three of them, they're judges. In our business, we have a privileged perception no matter what I think about my work, everything is finally judged by a presiding judge. The judge who hears the matter is the trial of the facts, right? And that that judge's perception becomes a privileged perception. So I'm very lucky. I, I must say that I'm in this business for two reasons. Thanks to North San Diego County Foster Parent Association, I was on the job for nine months without any formal training, as I said earlier. After nine months, they awarded me Social Worker of the Year. <laughs> and dealing with the court. How many child welfare services competencies are there? 1,400. <laughs> Not that many. <laughs> That's not exaggerated. <laughs> 28. If you look at the CWLA, uh, 28 recognized competencies. The one dealing with the court is the most difficult to master it. Call me weirdo, but I like dealing with the court. That's the reason why uh, I stayed in this business for this many years. With this, I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask me real tough Question. How do you work with service delivery systems to improve the delivery of services in the community? Good question. When I was a regional manager, I used to meet with all the contractor providers, partners, the service <coughs> providers on a monthly basis. At one point, I used to have 60, 70, providers at the table. What I do is I like to align everything since we have the federal outcomes that we have to comply with. So I look at the agency, mission, vision, values, goals, and the federal standards. And then I translate those expectations in the contract outcomes as well as service providers outcomes. And then it's a process uh, sometimes you get pushback from the providers, but once you explain to them, once you work with them, once you are persistent, usually they work with us. I always remind them, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about the children and family that we are serving for from this community. What is the best outcome we want for them? 
And as part of the, the CFS process, I review the outcome data with them on a quarterly basis, because that's what we are expected to do on a quarterly basis, tell them uh, what the outcomes are, uh, what's our compliance rate. I'm glad to see that report uh, uh, from 2014. Out of the 17 federal <coughs> outcomes, Lucas County is meeting 12. My priority will be on look at those five, what can we do differently. I also want to know what's going on in zip code 604, 605, and 609. <laughs> tell me something, please. I know you guys know something. I want to know what's going on. What do I need to do as an administrator to impact that uh, and have a positive outcome? Uh, I also know uh, the good news is that 50% of our children are under the age of five, the most vulnerable population. What can we do? What services are needed so that we can catered to that particular population. Uh, some of them, they are not even in the school, uh, so we need to make sure whatever safety net uh, we can come up with, that safety net is really solid and works. Uh, so that would be my approach, uh, to have a dialogue with them, uh, sit down with them. Uh, I'll do the same thing with the community. I'll go to the community if necessary, uh, and I know I'm having a meeting tomorrow, uh, I, I, I will schedule a special uh, town hall meetings. When I needed to expand my family resource center uh, contract in uh, San Mateo County uh, four years ago, I convened uh, two town hall meetings. And said, community, I am <coughs> your public servant, tell me, what do you want? How can we meet your need? What are your needs? So I would like to uh, keep an open mind and include that input. Thank you. Well, mine is more a comment, I guess, than a question. Um, when I first uh, looked at uh, your uh, package, your resume package, a little concerned when I saw, I think it was a three-page uh, cover letter for opening. But I was quite impressed uh, after reading it. And there were a lot of uh, things that I'm sure you're going to be covering both today and, and uh, later on. But, um, you know, the uh, information you have where you said that you organized a very successful board conference on uh, foster care, I was kind of interested in that one. Uh, your, when you say you follow the principles of interaction uh, management, I really like that, and I like what uh, you said you've done with the mutual tips. Um, hopefully you're going to share with us a little bit more about that also. Um, but for today and for right now, uh, you say that you uh, uh, you submitted recommendations for some legislative proposals in San Mateo. I was kind of wondering about that and what those proposals were. The one proposal was when we were uh, building our receiving home, I worked uh, with Congresswoman uh, Jackie Spear and she put in a year mark. That's their bad project, the politicians call it. I got $237,500 towards the construction of the receiving home, which was money that the county was able to save uh, from the taxpayer. The other proposal was regarding uh, the accessing uh, education information uh, for foster youth. Uh, in California, there was a big challenge. You know, our foster youth, they have a change of placement, enrolling, disenrolling. Uh, not receiving credits. So I had worked with uh, two legislatures and we were able to finally get that. Now, schools are mandated to enroll the children uh, pending verification. Uh, a, very, a lack of verification is not the reason that they can deny a child's enrollment. Uh, and then my biggest pet project that I'm still working on is regarding the Title IV-E. When you talk about the Title IV, as I said, the money is just sitting there, they are uncapped. When a child enters the foster care out of home care, the foster care eligibility folks, they have to go back to July 1996. Why? To determine the eligibility determination, it's called the look back provision. How much was the minimum wage back in 1996? 
four dollars and seventy five cents every year every year the federal government's expenditure on title 4e is going down instead of going up i would like to see a politician who is willing to work with me and my team on how can we utilize title 4e to avoid out of home placement which is more expensive and save money i would also like to remove the time after 18 months, okay, I gotta have a permanency and no more accessing funding. Remove that. Funding should be driven based on the need, need of a family, need of a child. <coughs> if a child needs a higher level need, such as group home to stabilize for at least three months, four months, six months, let's pay that high rate and then let's stabilize, but continue supporting rather than having those kind of restrictions. Uh, the other issue in the state of California was about medical. When each county has a different system. So if the child was moved from one county to another county, it used to take 30 days. So that barrier was also addressed by the political arena and the legislation uh, and the changes to expedite those. But I still got some ideas, uh, and again, I'm looking for anybody who is willing to sponsor some legislation, work with me. And by the way, thank you for your comments. Uh, as I said, I'm a, I'm a from a different culture. I was born and brought up in India. My family, my dad, his story was from black to the riches. My grandpa died when my dad was in the second grade. My dad had to quit schooling, started working in the farm. He made some money, went to Bombay, in those days Mumbai, uh, started working as a laborer, made some money, and he was able to somehow manage to get a small shop. That shop turned out to be a gold mine. He made so much money, bought a lot of houses, <laughs> properties, but he taught one thing. Since he could not complete the education himself, he wanted the best education for his four children. He taught us learning is a lifelong process. Modesty, hard work, giving back to community, fearing God, all those values that we all cherish, I learned those growing up there in my blood. I have a problem, even though you said three, four page. There are so many things that I have not even <coughs> mentioned. If you tell me, you give me 50,000 people and say, okay, here, now you can talk about this, I can talk. If you give me two people and say, this is an interview, I'm under pressure. <laughs> I'm under pressure. Again, that's, that's, my, that's my culture. That's who I am. Over the years, I had to really train myself. This is a civil service process. This is United States. If you don't tell them, they will not assume. You have to tell them who you are. And that's what drives me. I have a personal mission statement. That is my goal, that is my agenda. I demand exceptional. I repeat, I demand exceptional, not only from others, but from myself. That's what keeps me going every day when I enter my office. I want to give my 150%. So I hope uh, we'll have the opportunity to talk about the interaction management. And yes, sir, I had wonderful, very difficult personal situations. When you stay in this business for such a long time, it's comes with the job. I don't want to be on this extreme or on this extreme, but I had to let go 15, 16 people and some of them, they were really, really, really difficult. The important thing is that because of my training and coaching, half of them shook my hand before they left the office. The other half said, can we submit your name for a reference check? To me, that tells me that I have learned something about the management. 
there is always a human side of management. Management to me is something that it's on my screen saver. Manage from the left, lead from the right. Manage from the left, lead from the right. Management, planning, organizing, staffing, budgeting, evaluation, all left brain functions. Leadership, motivating, instilling, inspiring through the interaction. That's the right brain function. Over the years, I have practiced whatever I used to teach to the middle and top executives. I have tested, I have refined my skills, and I believe that's the reason why some of the things that you see are there. And as I said, some of the things I have even omitted, I could not even mention. But those are all executive competencies, and I believe uh, all of you needed to see that. To me, the other reason why I want to come here to Lucas County, I have a $20 gift card <laughs> that I've been carrying. I've been carrying for the last four years. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking only one simple question. <laughs> Tell me the year in which the first child abuse law in the United States was passed. 1962. Hmm? 62. 62. 62. 62. Any? One. 62. Two. 62. Three. No, sir. 1875. <laughs> 1980-75. I want you to go. Last year, my office moved into a nice building, and one of the conference name is I have named it after Mary Allen. You should you should see little Mary Allen. Sir. Can I write this? Can I talk about little Mary Allen? Mary Allen, when she was nine years old. Actually, let me start. When Mary Allen was born, her father was a victim of the Civil War. He died in the Civil War. There was a Civil War, right? Back in 18. Okay, I wasn't here, so I wanted to make sure. So when her mom started cleaning houses, she couldn't take care of little Mary Allen. So she took Mary Allen to an orphanage home, left there. Uh, another lady pretended to be Mary Allen's auntie, got Mary Allen. So much for adoption matching, right? No verification, nothing. And this so-called <coughs> auntie started abusing Mary Allen. She was chained. She was kept in the closet. Uh, she was beaten. Every day, belt mark all over her body. When Mary Allen was nine years old, a concerned neighbor by the name of Ada Wheeler saw her and wanted to do something. In those days, there were no child abuse laws. The cop says, Chief, we don't know anything. We don't know what to do. Finally, finally, she pleaded, got a U.S. foreign diplomat by the name of Henry Berg. They went to the court, got a protective custody warrant. Sounds something familiar? We do now. They had to remove Mary Allen. When she testified, there was not a single dry eye in the courtroom. Everybody can see. She was so emaciated, even though she was physically nine years old, she looked like three years old. The so-called auntie was convicted. Mary Allen went on to marry a man who had his two children. Mary herself had her two biological children. Mary Allen adopted one child. And Mary Allen went on to live up to 92 years. 
So that's little Mary Allen. The New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty Against Children were the one behind getting that legislation uh, law back in 75. Here is the irony. It was nine years after the first child abuse, I mean animal abuse law. It was after nine years of the first animal abuse law. Why do I want to come to the Lucas County? What does this have to do with this uh, past history? Eight years before, eight years before the first child abuse law, eight men and 14 women in this county got together mm -hmm. and said, let's create an orphanage home, a visionary light years before the child abuse. When did professional social work start in the United States? Anybody? 1904. Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital hired first social worker, professional social worker. He was not even a social worker, he was a PHN. In 2000 and 1905, at the first school of social work. Seven years before that, in Lucas County, Miss A.J. Brown was hired as a social worker. That's why I want to be in this county. I travel extensively. I have studied social services all over the world. The, one of the reasons why I came to this country, United States, and made as my home is, I grew up in a democratic country. I always wanted to be in a democratic country. And who better than the United States, right? The second thing is that this is the country where professional social work started. That's why I am here. That's why I want to give. This is my way of giving. Again, as I was saying earlier, my dad, until he died, he was expecting that one of these days, I'll wind up everything in the US, move back, live happily ever after. <laughs> he never realized that I wanted to create my own niche. I wanted to create whatever I do. And that's what I've been trying to do. So when we look at the story of uh, Mary Allen, it reminds us children have abundant resiliency provided we don't inflict system trauma. We have to be really, really, really careful in the job that we do. Sometimes unknowingly we wind up adding more to the children's and family's trauma and we have to undo that uh, working with the providers. <coughs> So I know that you've said a number of times the different reasons that you're interested in Lucas County, um, but there's like a hardcore sort of thing that I need to ask about that. Just sure. if, if social workers, if the casework folks in your county currently are at 92,000, um, your salary must be like way more than that. And will be very less than that moving to Lucas County. I'm just wondering what you're thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Only the book. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm making very close to the top uh, the, that this position has to offer. Very close. My gross is very close. Yeah. But the cost of living is. <laughs> so. Put you out to buy clothes. I, 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 was, I was just curious yesterday and I was Googling uh, to see what's the prevailing rain uh, in this uh, county. I saw 744 for one bedroom. I said, oh my God. <laughs> in San Mateo County, we can't even get a studio for 744. So it's a give and take. Uh, to me, again, one of the reasons why I became a social worker is not to make money. I, I, I look for intrinsic rewards. When I go to the court, I see a child getting adopted. 
That's a next to godly thing. It's a divine thing. A social worker when says, hey, I have a matching family here. That's creating, that's a birth of a family. I, I occasionally go to uh, court to witness those things, the, a miracle. Uh, in California, we provide services to youth up to 21. And I'm the manager of our adoptions program. Even though in last three years we have finalized uh, three adoptions of 18 plus years old, but since the passage of AB 12 uh, on December 5, 2013, my county, my agency became the second agency in the state of California to finalize an adoption of a 19 year old. Yeah. Los Angeles County, of course, being the largest county, they beat us by a few weeks. But, and, Sorry. Any other questions from the board? Um, just a couple questions, and I know that the staff has so many questions still, and we're running short on time, so let me just ask you to touch on a couple of things that, that have been sort of um, um, very, very key components to the concern of the staff. And, and one of those is um, the labor market. Unions. Um, um, what is your thought on unions? What is your thought on collective bargaining? Have you dealt with a union environment in the past? Um, give us an idea of, of your thinking um, and your mindset, um, because this is a, a union um, place of employment. So if you could just touch on that very briefly. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I have been uh, working um, in conjunction with the union for last 17, 18 years. Uh, as a supervisor, as a manager, I have met with them on a regular uh, <coughs> monthly basis. As I say, as an administrator, union is my biggest ally. As I say, union is my biggest ally. Why? What do they want? Decent salary, manageable workload, better working conditions. What do I want as an administrator? All those things. A happy employee is a productive employee. The issue comes up is when it's a disciplinary situation. That's where we usually have the disagreement. The union leadership is trying to protect their members' interest. But I, on the other hand, as an administrator, have to be fair, have to be consistent, and I have to apply the same standard to each and every situation consistently. That's where sometimes we don't see eye to eye. The other area in which is regarding the benefits, the pay raise is right. We start with 8%, 9%, and then we negotiate. That's the process we follow. Uh, you look at the most budgets for social services, 60 to 65 percent of your budget is salaries and benefits. Can we continue surviving since the Great Recession in 2008? That has become a major challenge for most organizations. How can we survive? Organizations are now practicing optional thinking, becoming more agile. Do I have to replace with a permanent employee? Can I do a contract? Can I, is this something that I can have a temporary employee for? That's a process most agencies in the entire United States are going through. One final question then. Um, <coughs> My understanding is that in California, you do not operate by passing monies. Ohio is very different, um, and we rely very heavily on the passage of levies. And so we are looking to ensure stability financially for the organization, and to do so, we need to not only put a levy on the ballot, but ensure that it is going to pass. Um, can you give us an idea of, of what steps you would take um, to ensure its success. Okay, so thank you. Just to give you an idea, 
uh, back in the state of California, we used to have three funding streams. As I said earlier, federal, state, and local. It used to be at 1.70-2010 matching. Because of the rec recession, Governor Brown decided to change everything. Everything got realigned, <coughs> meaning that 1% of the sale tax, the vehicle licensing fee, and Proposition 69 funding, everything went to respective county. <coughs> and it's called the protective sub-account. That's for Child Protective Services, APS, AB 109, that's the early inmate release. Those who are non-serious uh, offenders, they get released, they do community work. So now, the state has no stake. It's the federal as well as local county. And that poses a challenge. Every month, I have to look up in the sub-protective account to make sure how much revenue I have. This good and this bad. The good is when economy is doing good, we get more revenue, right? The bad is that when the economy is not doing so well, we get less revenue. That's when we need more money. People need more when the economy is down. So that has put a strain on um, the counties and that's where counties are becoming more fiscally responsive and practices some prudent practices <coughs> by having a savings uh, for the rainy days. Uh, that's what agencies <coughs> are doing. In my county, if I save money, I can keep 30% of the money in my HSA savings trust fund. <coughs> the county manager will take. In California, just like Ohio, the state of Ohio receives federal revenue and then passes to the county. <coughs> the California Department of Social Services receives the federal revenue, but the child welfare services is run by the counties, and we don't have a board like you. We have county manager as well as the board of supervisors who oversee the operations of the child welfare services. So that's the biggest difference uh, in the state of California. What I will do, as I said, I hope I already started the conversation, why it is really important to make sure that we pass the levy. Starting tomorrow when I meet with the partners, when I meet with the community members, I will start my education 101. I will start the process. The process has started. The train has already left the station. And I want the media, the print, the TV, uh, social media. I have worked with them extensively. I have no problem. I want to work with them again. I believe it's in, everything is in the message. What message do we want to convey? I want to make it a real simple message. Here is $75. Do we have the capability to say here, I'm going to give you $25 so we can draw down $75, or $40 to draw down $60? Once the community will understand, will realize that this is an economically sound practice. That's what in my county, the county manager and board of supervisors realized long time ago. That's why they are giving us that overmatch. So in the end, those counties, they have not fully expanded. They get some of their money in my county. That's a smart thing to do.